Recent development in the banking industry has uh, painted the picture of a sector that might be struggling. And even some of the players in the industry are looking at whether they could downsize their business, refocus their strategy or the business they are doing here in Ghana. But what is the situation on the ground? What are the thoughts of some of the big players in the industry? Are they also looking at getting out of the country or the outlook and the prospects are bright. On PM Express Business Edition, you're looking at banking in Ghana here today, getting the more perspective from the Managing Director and Chief Executive of uh, First Bank Ghana, Mr. Victor Yao Asante. Sir, thank you so much for your time and to opportunity to sit down with you and still even struggling to appreciate the, the branding and the name. And, and that is something I just want to really get your thoughts on the, the, the whole rationale behind the FMB, and now you, you're talking about uh, First Bank. Ghana. FMB, yeah. Thank you very much, George, and um, good, good afternoon, good day to everyone. Mm -hmm. um, yes, sir, we had to rebrand just to uh, mm -hmm. assume our parents' name. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been FBN Bank Ghana since uh, First Bank acquired mm -hmm. um, ICB in mm -hmm. 2013. Mm -hmm. uh, we've been trading under FBN for a while. Mm -hmm. uh, we thought um, it was wise at the 130th anniversary of the group. Mm. to change our name so that we had, had align our identities and, and so on. So basically that's what has happened. Mm. We've, we've just gone back to our parents' name. So we're now first bank. But what, what was the agreement initially between even the regulator? Because I knew that there were certain banks that when the other bank has gotten into the market before them, they changed the name. Uh, exactly. And, uh, and so why exactly. wasn't so, that gentleman's so agreement? So at the time we rich? came in, yeah. um, as you recall, there were other similar names mm -hmm. um, for example there was a uh, first bank with a c first bank uh, which was a financial institution yeah. not not a full bank so with first bank you can't you can't be first bank with a k so that that was a problem mm -hmm. so we use the parents initials so one of the things that you always hear about that is uh, why do you have n when you're in a Ghanaian bank and all of that yeah. so th those have been there we also have the confusion between fbn which is our former name and fnb which is First National Bank. Mm. So there was quite a number of things that, but once the name became available, mm. remember um, First Bank, for example, is no more. So we asked, we applied to the regulators and also as supervisors and so on. And so we had to go through the processes mm. of uh, making sure the name was now available. Mm. And that's why we are able to go back to our First Bank name, which is the original mm. name we've always wanted to use mm. because that's our parents' name. Mm. And it's a nice coincidence that at 130 years, uh, we do that, and we, it's been done for all the subsidiaries of First Bank mm. um, Group. So there isn't any arrangement like the situation of sta Standard Bank, Stambic Bank, and then Standard Chartered Bank, where which of them enter market first? So, so yeah, the market the, the the market first gets the name. Mm. So there was First Bank with a C. So uh, Register Generals will not give you a name First Bank with a mm. K. It doesn't matter. So mm. that was there. So that was a block. Mm -hmm. But that name is no more available um, in use. So now you can use it. Mm. Um, First National Bank, for example, like as I know it, we're not even allowed to use FNB because of the confusion with FBN. Yeah. So basically FBN was here before FNB. So yeah. those are the things that happen. Mm. But the market may also overtake the arrangements. Because everybody knows FNB, because they go to other countries, jurisdictions, and it's FNB. So those become, uh, yes, so there's that aspect where the regulators and the registrar general's department and so on will tell you what you can't use because that has already been given to somebody who came before you. So that happens a lot. Mm. Yes. Did it become a problem for you in terms of I struggled as a consumer in the banking space always, and sometimes you've been telling the stories as well. Did it became a problem for you in terms of the customer appreciation and the, the branding in the space about going by the initials or going by this and all the rest? Well, I struggled personally. Well, there is, there is. Uh, but then you have to keep at it and make sure your branding is, is very, very, very mm -hmm. apt so that uh, you keep keeping at it. Um, and there are, for example, days where people arrive at my, at my, my office only to find out they're in the wrong bank or they, are, they go to the other office when they want to come to me and they say, I'm in your bank. And then I say, where are you? And then they find out that for the first time, it dawns on them that mm. there's 
FNBN and SFBN. Mm. So thankfully, we now have a different name. So mm. hopefully that will help both of us, and I hope that it helps. It, it, they might not be wrong because looking at where you also transition from to this new bank as a CEO and as an MD, if I'm, if I'm yeah, right, that's, I might that's not also, be wrong. That's, that could also be a, a factor because mm. uh, um, previously I was associated with FNB, so mm. I'm sure it plays on people's minds. So thankfully, we are at a junction where hopefully going forward, I have to spend less in communication in terms of time and resources and the, the clarity is there. Let me start from the, from the personal level before I move into the, the proper investment. I'll be coming back to, to also gauge from you moving forward the focus for this bank and what you want to do and all the rest. But you personally, if you want to look forward, how have you seen the industry in terms of the transition? And we, we all know where you've been for in this banking industry and you being now an MD and a CEO of a different bank as well. From the personal level, how have you seen this industry? The challenging times, well, the interesting times, and I'll come to the, the broader, but let's so look at from the personal perspective. There are, so well. there are different challenges for different banks. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, irrespective of how big or how strong you are from, for wherever you came from. I've been here for five years, so that's, that's not um, um, that young. Um, but basically, I've been involved first in a build and then a growth. So a bank that is building is, it will have different focus on a bank that is growing. So um, the experiences have been different. Mm. I, for example, spent um, 10 years in Stanchart. Mm. Stanchart was already a very well established bank with all the um, product suit and so on and so forth. So my focus will be different. That will just be defending and making sure you keep your market share. Um, FNB had just basically entered and now really, really from the scratch when I was there. Um, and First Bank is somewhere in between what FNB was when I was there and where Stanchard is, where you have something to work on because IC, ICB has been here um, now 28 years to entirely. By the time we took over, it, it had mm -hmm. been here about um, 18 years. Mm -hmm. So there was something to work with. So that was basically different. That's where you were now um, growing from something that had been built. So you do a combination of the building and the growth. Mm -hmm. so, so the scenarios are different. Yes, the, the macroeconomics and everything affects mm. us the same thing. So when it's all said and done, we are going after the consumer in a certain uh, macroeconomic environment. Mm. So then that also comes to play. But there are nuances at the primary level. Then you go to the marketplace and then try to uh, make sure that the matrices at play are aligned uh, to your advantage as you can. How is the industry doing? There are some who want to move away from the, the bottom line, the PBT and then the profit after tax. And look at the, the, the ratios and your liquidity and not just you, the banking industry as a whole. There are some who think that, listen, we shouldn't be swayed by the profits. The industry that, has that, not that recovered fully from the post-domestic debt exchange program. Banking is a marathon. So mm. it, I don't think it should be too short term. It's, yes, um, return to shareholder is very, very important. And uh, they must always show that at least there must be a trajectory mm. or there must be momentum always the right numbers that you think reflect a fair return to the shareholder mm. but um, banking is also about yes the ratios and so on and not just the PBT mm. because uh, my ratios may look better even though my PBT is smaller because it's a, it's a, it's a measure of the capital that mm. I've, I've used to get to where I am so whilst I may I mean for example show a, a 300 million PBT mm. compared to somebody showing 1.2 billion mm. you have to look further than that and see what capital was deployed, how much resources was at, at this guy's uh, disposal to, to churn out this. So that's when the ratios become important, return on equity, return on assets. So that's why banks measure more on that aspect mm. than a PBT, which is mm. a standalone. So that is very important. Banks must measure what they do because banks are also investments. Uh, uh, shareholders put money into their investments and they expect a fair return. Having said that, banks must play a different game from um, let's say a buy and sell and all of that. You can't uh, uh, invest in a bank and just be very short term. Mm. And um, there are seasons uh, which are affected by the macros, sometimes even the micros. So you have to also understand that that happens. And banks are here, Stanchard for example is 120 years plus. Mm. My bank has spent 130, it's the oldest bank in West Africa, 130 years. In fact, it was um, focused on by CNN when he did a series of the mm. 100, 100 years companies. Mm. It means that you must have something that stays with you for a long time. Mm. Else, you just go 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 years and you are gone. You mm. must have a short-term return in mind 
but a long-term view in terms of longevity and all the things that you have to do. So the nuances mm. might be slightly different. Is it fair for those who want to, maybe they, know, they don't really appreciate the developments in the industry, and for some who would want to move away from the, the profits and still argue that, listen, despite those strong profits being posted, most of the commercial banks in the country have still not recovered fully from the shocks of the domestic debt program. We haven't. Um, quite a number of banks still need some time. Because the thing is, even the, at the country level, it's not done. It's not mm. done. Uh, there are still one or two things that need to be done before mm. we are there. Um, so the domestic debt exchange program actually has not ended for the country, nor for banks. Mm. But have we turned um, the, the most difficult part? I think we have. Mm. Because the first two years were always going to be the most difficult. Mm. Um, the, um, the, the country has finished what it has to do domestically. Mm. But it's also the real bonds and all of that, which mm. eventually... Some of your banks have interest as yeah, well. Yes, some, some banks have interest and yeah. some individuals. And also, it's also about country risk and all of that, mm. country grades and so all of that. So even if you don't have interest directly, if you don't fix it, it is these issues, if you are in default or you are, you are unable to fix your long-term outlook and all of that, it comes to affect your rating, which therefore comes to affect all the businesses banks do and so on. So if I go out there and my bank is in Ghana and Ghana country economy is in trouble, I'm automatically affected. Mm. So whether I have... I hold your bonds or not, there's an effect there. Mm. So what I'm saying is um, we, we've done some good work mm. around uh, fixing um, the near default or default, depending on who we're mm. speaking, but there's still some distance to go. And yes, banks have not fully recovered from it. And it means that there's still more work to there's be done. There's still more work to be done. To, to do the corrections, Absolutely. to fully stabilize Absolutely. things. Absolutely. With, with respect to these challenges that the broader macro and even the environment, that impacts on every business and even every individual that is within that space. Has it gotten to that level where banks, or even your bank, may have to strategize in cutting some units, focusing on new areas, and even to the extent of trying to move outside? Because when we, another bank recently gave an indication that they had to move out and order, the perception was that the industry is struggling, the industry is not doing well. And then there are some women say that, listen, move beyond the, the profit. And that there will be more banks that will soon announce that, listen, we are downsizing, we are going to focus more on uh, commercial banking, or co focus more on all those things. And that is something we should expect. Has the challenge got into that stage where FMB, for it's instance, <laughs> if we are planning to do about <laughs> maybe 50 branches next year, so. First bank, you're trying to do 50 branches next year. Because of all these challenges, you're struggling to convince your shareholders that the physical evidence is needed rather than being focused so much on fintechs. So, so let me tell you, uh, the, the challenges banks face have not changed. Um, it's always been there. Mm. Um, so it's not like uh, we have a situation where right now um, there's a different challenge. Sometimes it's the severity mm. or the timing and all of that. So everything that we are doing has happened before. Mm. My bank, I saw the 130 years, it's faced two pandemics and it's faced uh, two world wars and all of that. So it, it's always going to happen. Mm. Um, the banking is about risk return. Mm. So yes, a lot of banks are always appraising their return uh, based on their risk appetite and so on and so forth. So it's different for every bank. Um, some banks may decide that the risk versus the return is no more worth it and therefore it's time to go somewhere else because maybe it's also about alternatives. Mm -hmm. So for example, a banker can say that uh, my base is not even in Africa. I'm just uh, in Africa as, a, as an extension of my European base, mm -hmm. for example. Um, and I think the risk, risk return mm -hmm. in Africa, which is maybe 5% of, of my holding, is becoming, uh, in terms of, it's becoming too much for me. So let me share that 5% and bring it back into mm -hmm. the area where I'm more focused on and, and do that. It, it doesn't, it's not necessarily uh, a reason to say that uh, the banks are not doing well mm. or are doing well. It's just a, an individual decision or, and so on and so forth. So there are 23 banks. 20 will decide that, okay, this return still works for me. I'm a regional bank. My, my, my head office is in Nigeria. So um, when Ghana coughs and I sneeze and so on and so forth, we mix a match and we're out there. I have nowhere to go in terms of that. Mm. Or I'm a multinational bank. My head office is in 
in Asia, my returns and so on are different. Or African risk is different. So absolutely, whilst they are all important, the, 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 the baskets of, of reasons that decisions are taken are very different from mm. bank one to bank two. Mm. So yes, banks may be struggling. Yes, banks may be f um, uh, having issues around the DEP, but the decision around um, leaving or not leaving is not taken lightly at all. And I don't think there's going to be a rush out of the door at all. I don't mm. think so. This, this is, this is, is it more of a, a shareholder decision? I would or maybe it's more of let the numbers speak. Because if tomorrow uh, your, 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 your major shareholder says that, Mr. Asante, uh, looking at the way things are going, I want to get back to Nigeria. Some will see that, is it a shareholder decision yeah, or it's about it's a the shareholder numbers decision. speaking for itself? Ultimately, it's a shareholder decision and the shareholder decision is based on return. So the shareholder would not just say, I'm making so much money out of Bank Ghana, but I want to get out. They are always going to say, what are the alternatives for me? Would I make more money from somewhere? Or what are the risk factors? I don't like Ghana's risk. I don't like Ghana's mm. I don't like Ghana's outlook. Mm. I don't like this or that and so on. So, but it's an investment. Bank is also an investment. So mm. the decision necessarily would be a reflection of the risk return to the shareholder. So mm. yes, it's all about the shareholder. I mean, you've spoken, Mr. Sam, you've spoken largely about the, the Africa risk. What is the Ghana risk? And has the Ghana risk now more heightened than 10 years ago? Um, I, I think we've, we've gone through quite a bit in the last because, um, look, we, let's face it, uh, COVID, two years of it was, was a big deal. Um, the people have laughed about it, but the Ukraine-Russia war in the beginning was, was a big deal. And it's not just Canada has cited that. If you listen to everyone, uh, whether advanced country or... So, yes, we've had some headwinds. We've had some significant headwinds that are not easy to take. And um, so, yes, Ghana has suffered a little bit of that. We've also had a lot of instability around exchange rate. Mm. And that's one of the biggest problems some mm. banks may have. Um, mm. People talk about posting profits and mm. so on. Yeah. Um, as soon as you, you, you break it into mm. the foreign currency or your mm. initial investment mm. and so on, you realize mm. that the city mm. profit is I'll, actually... I'll, I'll be coming more to that, that, that Mr. So to when, when so all <laughs> these FX dynamics and yeah. how it impacts on yeah. your operations. Yeah. But, so but I, I just want to find out that, I mean, this, this Africa risk, i.e. Ghana risk, you think that I don't think Ghana risk is. We've we've gone through a, a period of uh, um, issues, and the whole world has, mm. not just Africa, not just Ghana. Mm. So we have uh, as has happened before, and will happen probably in a future mm. time. But have you managed it well? I would say yes, to a large extent, we manage it well, and I think we will come out of it. Indeed, coming out of Mr. Victoria Asante is the managing director and chief executive of the First Bank Ghana. This is PM Express Business Edition. Let's look at banking in Ghana today. Has the risk heightened or is moderate or low or is it even getting better? We'll be right back after this break. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition. Let's look at banking in Ghana today. How is it doing? Is it quite interesting, challenging? or indeed some of the banks are struggling to stay alive. I'm engaging the Managing Director and Chief Executive of First Bank Ghana, Mr. Yao Sante, or say Victor Yao Sante. Yeah, Thank you so fine. much for your time. And, you and, 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 and let's come back to the FX challenge. And that's something that some will say that every institution, I mean, even the dollar itself suffers some blips and all the rest. And I remember I engaged one a big bank in this industry and said that, George, listen, we, we, our profit, we, we witness a strong growth in our profits. When we go to our group, it's a problem. It and uh, we are seen as not doing well. So we can post even about 800, 400 million and all the rest in dollar terms as peanuts. And some have even linked the FX situation as a big challenge for you as well. How is that challenging as well for a lot of players like yours. I believe that you do your conversion yeah, to absolutely. dollars back to your parent bank and all the rest. It, it does. Well, thankfully for me, my translation goes through dollars and then ends up in Naira. Okay. In Naira, it's, it's usually playing with the city at the same time. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but target setting usually for, for currency um, uh, match for all the subsidiaries and everything is in dollars. Mm -hmm. and, and that's where the issue is. Um, basically, when you look at the dollar equivalent of... <clears throat> whatever return you've made, that's when people start struggling. Mm. So I made, I made 100 million last year, it was one is to 10. I made uh, mm -hmm. 140 million this year, it's one is to 15. Mm -hmm. 
Um, CD terms, I've, I've done better than last year, but in dollar terms, I haven't. So that's always a big issue around the exchange issue. So once you translate into what you should do in the group reporting, then, then I can understand how people are saying that it doesn't necessarily do that. Um, when the recapitalization started, it was, it was about 70 to 80 million um, dollars equivalent of, of 400 million cities was then. At the moment, 400 million cities, it's, uh, it's, it's much less than that. It's mm -hmm. probably half of, of that amount and so on. So it tells you what, 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 you, what gets eroded around your, your, your investment. So you must make a correction for that to start talking about true return and all of that. So mm -hmm. it is a big issue we have, yes. Is it a main, some have linked it to one of the, the pull factors, or sorry, the push factors for some banks now being forced to align or realign the operations. And even some banks have been looking at what they will call a strategic review of the operations because when they, they grow so much numbers in CD terms, converting it into dollars is a major problem. And that becomes a, a major difficulty again in convincing your shareholders outside that listen, the business here in this country or the bank here in this country or first bank in Ghana is a profitable business, is doing well, look at our ratios and the numbers and all those things. No, so, so you are looking at your ratios and numbers and you are looking at projections for a period. Mm -hmm. So if the period that you are looking at is, is uh, your cumulative average uh, growth rate mm. is above the threshold the group sets, you are fine. That's not an issue. Uh, so it, it's, if you are reporting dollars, what it means is that you must make a lot of CDs to more than make up for the depreciation mm. that you are making. I think investment decisions uh, should be made based on opportunity. And also, when people are downsizing and all of that, I think it's also a reflection of what they decide to go through their strength. Uh, if you can see that the banks that are very strong with corporate finance, there are banks that are strong with trade, there are banks that are strong with commercial banking and all of that. So people appraise their own strengths and decide to play more of the strengths. Mm -hmm. But one thing is certain. When you, when you, when you incur costs, it, becomes, it stays with you, but mm -hmm. revenue is not assured. So in making investments, as soon as you take an investment decision, remember you've taken a cost decision. The revenue is... It's, it's a hope. Mm. It's, it's uh, something you hope that will, will come based on your research. Mm. So if I open five branches, I go and make a research and open five branches at the same time. It costs me this amount. I recruit people. I must pay them. It is fixed. I can't run away from paying mm. salaries and so on. If the returns then don't come, and then I'm in trouble because mm. my costs are fixed at least in the short term. Mm. So those are the issues that we must look at to make sure when we invest, we are really, 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 really investing for the right reasons. Else, it will catch up with you. So it is possible that some banks may downsize or may rise size or may decide that to reduce where they, are, they, they, are, they don't have strength in and go towards where they are strength. But speaking for myself, I've only been growing. I'm now 28 uh, 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 touch points. Mm -hmm. um, it was 18 about five years ago. We've added 10, including mm -hmm. uh, agencies and food branches. Mm -hmm. We have refreshed our branches. Mm -hmm. We have uh, made our branches bigger. We have added... Uh, a lot of um, digital products and so mm -hmm. on. So I am in a growth mode, like I said. So I I still believe in Ghana, mm -hmm. and I think we are going to get um, get to get a good return. Fair return in, in talking about the, the the growth mode and all the rest, I, and I just quickly want to find out from you that is the brick and mortar still the strategy for you? Absolutely, as an organic growth for you, because in the time there we were talking about. FinTech, technology, and all the rest. Some are still questioning the, the relevance of brick and mortar. In terms of organic growth, and you said you're still growing your branch, what is the root? Mix or fiscal evidence, yeah. brick and mortar, as an organic growth strategy to expand the bank? Brick and clicks. Mm. Um, I say that to mean that brick and mortar is very important, mm. but the digital uh, space is crucial. So you must mix it. Look, we are not going to be a zero um, uh, brick and mortar bank in Ghana, or for that matter, any other bank. Mm. Uh, but you need a certain minimum. So for example, even if it's just uh, 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 um, um, the, the digital products, once in a while you must go into a branch, and there must be a branch that serves a certain catchment area. So if I look at the 10 or 16 regions of Ghana, and I'm covering five, six, seven, it means I must have 
brick representations in these ones mm -hmm. where people must go in. Sometimes uh, they must banking sometimes a contact spot. Even if at the moment that I'm opening an account, these days uh, there's biometrics and all of that. So that means I must have uh, uh, those branches close to. So there's a certain minimum branches, even if you decide to go completely uh, 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 branchless, there are certain minimum branches you must have mm -hmm. as a bank. And we are not there yet. Mm -hmm. So we must go there. If you ask me, a typical medium-sized bank in Ghana should have 60 branches maybe. I'm not there yet. Mm -hmm. Maybe 50, maybe 60 um, to cover properly. Um, not the same branches, not the same sizes. Sometimes it may be smaller, sometimes it may be bigger, and so on and so forth. But you need a certain overall situation around fiscal presence. After that, then you add a lot more using your digital platforms and channels, which is what we've done. If you look at it critically, most banks have about 15 to 20 mm -hmm. key digital products that are in, but only three, four, five are very important to customers. Mm -hmm. USSD, internet banking, mobile app, three or so. If you cover these four or five, you are covering 80, 90% of the population. And they also must have the device to use it. So it is important to make sure your brick and mortar is in place and then you also add your digital solutions mm -hmm. to it. So have these two. So I would say not brick and mortar, but brick and clicks. Mm, interesting. I mean, come back to the FX situation as well. And there are some who have attributed the, the current pressure on the Ghana city to more of excess demand and activities of speculators and all those things. And there are some who are also saying that the banks cannot be excused from this does it contribute to the challenge? What do you say to that? No, no, the banks are just intermediaries. Banks only, uh, banks, are, banks are basically doing payments and settlements mm -hmm. uh, based on the trade and all of that. Uh, what I think is happening a little bit more is that we still, our balance of trade is still in, uh, against us, i.e. We, we bring in more than we take out. Mm -hmm. And so far as we have that situation, we'll have a problem. And that's what we should, we should try and fix. We mm -hmm. should fix that issue where we take out more that we bring in. Mm -hmm. Or we must account for everything that goes out. It is possible that we probably have a lot that goes out that don't come in. And mm -hmm. we, we seem that happen, especially in the gold side, mm -hmm. where some countries account for more imports of gold from Ghana than our official records mm -hmm. show. So until we have a that situation, we must try and have some localization of certain things we must be bold, we must take bold decisions. And these bold decisions must be taken around some things we can't bring into the country because mm. they put unnecessary pressure on the demand for FX. Mm. Until we get to that point, and we've, we've been there before, I think, when COVID came and trade collapsed, we had a situation where um, our, our in imports were very, very, very much yeah. reduced. Yeah. But all these luxury things, all the lots of money people are spending on cars and a few mm. things, of course, people must have their lifestyle, mm. but we must have that interventions where we must say no. First things first, let's make sure our trade deficit is addressed, mm -hmm. else we will always have these situations. Two years, three years stabilization, maximum four years, and then we have a quick dive. Mm. I mean, the, 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 the structural issues will always stand, some would say, but just over the past three weeks or two weeks, that sustained blip, some, something that speculation has played a major part some commercial banks making demand for dollars when they don't even have city covers and all the rest. And, and, and that is feeding into no, what we are seeing just, I just the, just I don't the want past to keep dollars. What do I keep dollars for? I don't need to keep dollars if I don't have demand. But there have been, there, there have been reports about some banks demanding dollars yeah, when they don't demand, need it. No, no, we only demand when there's a, client, there's a client demand for mm. it. So if I don't have city cover for it and I demand the dollar, what cities am I using to pay for it? I mm. must give you, it's a spot settlement. Mm. As soon as you give the dollar, I might give you the cities. Mm. So if I don't have it, I don't take it. And I don't want to keep dollars. Look, the regulator makes any bank keeping dollars very punitive. I keep a cover in my dollar exposure in cities. To the standard recently, some banks even wanted to charge people for just keeping dollar yeah. balances in them. So the regulation that we have now is very punitive. And regulators are also taking out, sucking out a lot of um, CDs from banks uh, using the new CR rules and so mm. on. So those are more uh, problematic for banks now than even uh, keeping dollars. We don't, I don't want to keep dollars mm. if there's no demand. Mm -hmm. I only go to central bank when I get an aggregation of my demand for my customers who ask me to do settlements and payments for them and then I go to central bank. Mm. So it's not fair for those who are out there thinking no, that the commercial not. banks but, uh, have contributed to 
the the speculatory activities well, I, I, the, I don't think the, so. the, 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 the current excess demand for dollars what happens when people don't so need what it. happens is that when people are worried they do what they do is that they try to bring forward obligations that will fall due later mm -hmm. that's where sometimes this happens but not because a decision of banks but a decision of uh, industry players mm -hmm. so for example uh, we s we've seen some gallop so if you projected that your CD, you, you did your pricing and everything, and your CD dollar rate will be 15 CDs or 16 at the end of the year. And then you wake up today, it's already 15 CDs. Mm -hmm. You just say something that you are going to pay in October, let me pay for it now. Because remember, people sometimes have credits. It's they, they bought the goods or the, the components that they need, but they just have arranged a six month payment cycle. Now, you take the decision and say, why wait for six months? If I do that, I've already priced and probably received the CDs for it. So why don't I just? pay for what I have to pay for. And that's when you have issues of people calling so-called speculation or, or bringing forward some payments who are going to otherwise wait for it. Mm -hmm. And then once you have a rush for the door, or the, it becomes a, 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 a self-serving situation where now everybody's saying, let me do it, let me do it, until there's come and there's a lot of oversupply. Mm -hmm. And I think Central Bank has done a lot of interventions this week. Mm -hmm. So hopefully people will know that they, they don't need to uh, bring forward payments that ought to be made, and therefore that would then calm people down. But yes, as soon as, and that is why we should never allow it to slip, as soon as we have that slip, it becomes everybody now starts rushing for the door and that is mm. a problem. Yeah, and, and for you, you believe that th these, are, these are blips and things are going to normalize very soon? Yeah, I think so, uh, but it depends on the supply situation. Mm. Because, you see, um, people are rational. People are, everybody's taking decisions based on what, what the marketplace is telling them. If I woke up last, day, uh, last week and it's 14 and it's now 15, I'm going to make a decision which says, get my dollars as quickly as, as I can because I've hedge already priced. against inflation yes, or hedge exactly. against the risk. Absolutely. So the hedging becomes uh, bringing forward some payments that you must make. They mm. can even uh, negotiate a discount for an early payment mm. and, then, and then try to pay for it. Mm. But eventually, you can only pay for something that has bought in. So eventually, um, we get a situation where people now don't even have the CDs because you must have the CDs to pay for it. Yes. Then things now calm down. We've seen a situation where speculation took us to 13, 14, but we came back to 8 because people now had dollars that they didn't need for, but they had CDs they need to pay. You need to pay your staff in CDs. If you go and buy dollars and put it in your account and you can't pay your staff, what do you do? You have to sell it and mm. so on. So, um, yes, we've had situations, but there's a point to which people will now have to stop. So, mm. hopefully, this short period, you know, around this time is also when people pay dividends. Mm. And we've had a situation where the cocoa didn't do as well as it's always done. So it means yeah. that we had a, a shortfall. There were some delays with some of the arrangements we were doing with the IMF and World Bank. Thankfully, some of them have come through. So we've had some issues around that. But thankfully, my understanding is that all of this it will come to an end when we have the next tranche of IMF money. Cocoa prices has also now gone up. Uh, production is also going up. So I expect in the short to medium term, all of this will come What down advice again. will you give to your, your, your clients and even businesses who are in a panic, if I can use that expression, that panic mode right now and all the rest? There are some who spoke about hedging and all the rest. If I should walk to you or any of your treasury officers and all the rest, what advice do you have for businesses out there in these times that are, some are in a panic mode, some are exposed, there are hospitals that are, have so much FX exposure in terms of the medicines and the refills yeah. and all those things. For these potential clients of yours, what are you telling them? Or what well, it, it's you easy to them? say calm down, but I think the, the, the solution should rather come from the managers of our economy. Mm. Once they make sure supply is there, everybody will calm down anyway. I'm not, it's very easy for me to say calm down, it's going to be okay. What, are, what if it is not mm. okay? Because mm. I'm looking at the bit about maybe hedging, maybe reduce your exposure. And all those so there's fixed. always a mix mm. so maybe you should do accelerate what you have to accelerate mm. uh, but don't do um, to an extreme mm. end where it becomes too much for you mm. so yes there must be a mix but the biggest solution is supply side mm. once there's a supply side of it and it's fixed and there's a flow into the market uh, like the central bank has done lately mm. people now see that there's no need to panic or once people fill their pockets enough and uh, they have enough dollars and so on, and there's no more demand for it, people. And we've seen that before. Mm. And I think people should be careful mm. because they may be holding dollars, they will have to now sell at the You a think much. we're going to get there very soon? Because there's, there's a limit which something could rise. When the next thing for the stock market to always say that it rises to a point, the next thing is that it drops. I think we have stabilized this week. It's, it's a supply issue. Once the supply issue is sorted, mm. 
um, the panic will, will do, 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 do you have your license back to do the FX business? Oh yes, we have. We have had it for a long time. Mm, and we have, had it have, have time. you addressed all the problems? Absolutely. That led so it's, to it's all these one of actions. these things. Um, so bank, you know, Ghana country risk is not a problem. Sometimes our people have to pay a little bit more earlier than they they, they would otherwise have done that. But all of that, it's not just my bank and issue it's, it's, mm. it's an industry issue which we are mm. working with regulators mm. to resolve and it was about reporting issue it's not that uh, first bank ghana was was involved in absolutely any none. fx manipulations absolutely and all none. the rest absolutely none at all absolutely none at all in absolutely. terms of the assurance and getting back to your clients has this thing been communicated as well oh now? yeah we've um, um all of that is resolved uh, mm. we are doing uh, business as usual there's no issue our clients who stay with us understand completely what the issues were, and we've, we've done that. Zizante, when I come back, I want to look at non-performing loans, the cost of credit, and also the outlook for your bank going forward. There, there's talk about consolidation. Is that on the table or something that, George, well, we want to do organic growth, so don't talk about consolidation. This is PM Express Business Edition as I engage the MD and Chief Executive of First Bank, and looking at development in the banking industry and whether things are stabilizing or things are indeed getting very hard for these banks that have stayed with us even in challenging times. PM Express Business Edition, we right back after this break. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as we talk about banking in Ghana today. Are the banks struggling? Are the numbers? Is there more to what we are seeing in terms of those uh, published profits or Indeed, they are doing very well. I'm engaging the managing director of the First Bank Ghana, Victor Yao Asante. Let's come to a very interesting thing. People paying their loans. And yeah. some are saying that typically, coming on the back of COVID, obviously, it was expected for those high non-performing loans that we are seeing. But there are also some who play in the school of thought that, listen, we cannot take the banks out of this. What's the level of scrutiny that they do or they undertake of their clients? And not just focusing on meeting the targets when it comes to extending these loans. These high NPOs, how do we get around it? Well, uh, f to, to an extent, NPOs is also a reflection of the macros. Um, so typically, uh, as you can see right now, um, interest rates are trending around 30% per mm -hmm. annum. And that's huge, 30% per annum. So when you borrow 100 million, you must bring 130 million, which means you must make sure that you are, you are earning at least a return which is higher than what you have to pay for, just interest cost, before you do all the other things. So um, the business of managing businesses is it's, it's, it's very, it's very, 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 very high. You have to be very alert and you have to do well to make sure. So um, MPLs always rise when there's, there's a problem with, with, mm. with the macros, and mm. that's what is happening. If I charge you 30% per annum and your business is not thriving and so on, we have uh, hyperinflation sometimes, um, we have depreciation, we have all manner of things that are going against you, the probability that you may default is very high, mm. and that's what is reflecting mm. in, the, in the markets. Nothing to do with whether banks are assessing their customers well or not. And, that, and that's the question about the due diligence. Some would say that maybe the banks are focus so much i mean no, very no, for high example, targets to your for credit example, officers if, if, if they are forced to push out escrows looking at their no, no, targets absolutely. and all those Bus things then no no business must go on so for example look at manufacturing manufacturing probably is bringing in um, um, some some imports to help the manufacturing process maybe 50 percent of their of their business of their whole production is imported now you must bring the 50 percent in dollars and uh, maybe your end to end from when you convert to when you get cash is three months. In three months, you've lost maybe 10% of the value of the CD value of your price that you did. So that's always a problem. So all these things, factors that may change based on how the macros are working may not have been available when the credit appraisal was being done. Mm -hmm. So, and not to talk about all other people, off takers who also get into their own trouble. So somebody must pay in a month. They are paying in six months because they are in their own trouble. That becomes a problem for you because by the time you receive your money, uh, the, the real value of it in, in, in dollar terms or in foreign currency terms has significantly reduced. So all these things now come together to become a problem for you. So now you come back to your bank and say, let me restructure mm. because I can't pay you because a whole lot of things went against me. And that is why 
it is always important we have a very strong uh, uh, macroeconomy that we operate in. As soon as those things start going off, uh, people start defaulting and, mm. and MPOs uh, mm. become a problem. So mm. it is always that factor that mm. comes to haunt us. It's not a matter of necessity. It's not the due diligence it, being no, carried out because be there, there are some are saying bit, that no. most of you banks are, are focused so much on the targets and no, trying no. to grow the, the other book thing, and all those things. Listen, so that due diligence has not bank, been done. Take my bank. For five years, I haven't paid dividend, even though I've been making profit. Mm. The reason being that I want to make sure my balance sheet is very, very strong. Mm. I want to make sure that when I say that I'm a sound bank, I am a sound bank. And that's why my cash uh, CR is, 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 is very high. Mm. That's one of the highest. It is a deliberate effort because you know that this economy can take a lot of, um, you know, uh, uh, knocks sometimes. So if you're in a business and as soon as you make profit, you take all the profit out, you're already setting yourself out for, for failure if mm -hmm. things go wrong. So people must also be a bit, uh, you know, measured around how much they, they take out uh, dividends out of their business and so on. You must hedge around what these things by keeping some of their return in the business, reinvesting in the business. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would do. And I, that's what I hope other people would do whether it's a small uh, business or a large business, mm -hmm. you must keep some of your profits in mm -hmm. for the rainy day because there are always rainy days around this, this part of the world. Mm -hmm. in, in trying to get around this challenge of this NPL as well, what is the window or the door that some of your clients can come in to renegotiate? Because some are saying that the biggest challenge is how those NPLs are impacting on fresh cost of credit and I'll be coming to the interest rate no, argument no, no. as well. But but once I, I, I give you money and you are you are not paying me, I'm I'm in more trouble than you are. Mm. So I must work with you to bring it back. Right? I'm not interested in realizing my collateral and going through all that. I I'm not a real estate uh, uh, company where mm. I must now come and take a, a building that you give me to be sick. No. My primary, primary, primary objective is to make sure you trade yourself out of your MPOs. Mm. And that's why I restructure, maybe give you longer uh, term arrangement uh, and so on, give you all the support so that you can dig yourself out of it mm. and then pay me and then go into business. Because banks only exist uh, when uh, customers exist. I don't want you to fold up. I want you to come back into good business and continue. Mm. And in any case, Loyalty comes from people who you have helped out of their difficulty more than the new customers. Mm. So I'm not interested in leaving you at all because you have MPOs. MPOs is a fact of life. Mm. They, the only reason why I may, be, um, I may have issues with you is how you make your choices in difficult times. What you postpone. Is the CEO going to postpone buying a new car because mm. now is not? Those are the primary objects, but you can't still live as business as usual when mm. you have problems. I will need you to cut in some places. And that's when then I come to you and say, these are crucial things you must do. These are things you may, you may suspend mm. whilst we go through it. Like you something must give. You don't mm. just come to me and say, mm. and my business is shut and mm. I'm in trouble, mm. and, but I still want to live my, my lifestyle and the bank should take Credit over. Credit Reference Bureau helping as well in dealing Absolutely this, helping. Uh, helping and helping. more can be done. It's helping. And you know, credit reference bureau it's, it's as good as the information that all banks give in. Mm -hmm. So so far as we are committed that when somebody defaults, we report into that and all of that. It helps. Are you sharing your your your, your most valued clients' information with the credit uh, reference? Abs absolutely, every You're committed to it. You are only you are only valuable when you are doing the right thing. Mm. If you are not doing the right thing and you are doing the wrong thing, I have because to the, the complaint was that most of the banks in the past were not willing to share their, their priority clients we are doing that who are now. doing so well that, with other banks for them to go and chase after them. No, no, no. It's, it's, it's been done now. In fact, this regulatory and the regulator is also sitting in the middle and making sure. So they check what has happened when they come in because the regulator has access to all our information and they check what we've been reporting to the bureau and all of that. So apart from trust, there's also control um, around how we do this. Mm -hmm. So everything you put in place, as you know, when it comes to these regulations and so on, you must you must first expect people to to self to self comply, mm. but you must also put in mechanisms that ensure that you are checking on that, and that's where regulators are very important and mm. crucial in these matters. High interest rates. Some people think that the banks are making some mm. good profits, and that is why the banks are so excited when the rates are so high. Absolutely no way. I don't mm. want high rates because MPLs go up, like you said. The industry mm. MPL is very high. Um, banks are only intermediaries. People always complain about the fact that it's high. 
But these same people who come in and bring his money wants very high uh, de fixed deposit rates, returns, and so on. I pick a fixed deposit from a, a company, and it's 20, 25. Uh, the effective cost is 28. So it means that my margin is just 2% to get to 30, 34. So if you look at the build-up of, of a cost of funding, the banks are the ones who get the list. Mm. Banks are the ones who get the list. Interesting. Yes, because I, I borrow from you at 20. Your pension is probably giving it to me 20, 23. Uh, just 20, 25% CRL. Effective cost is 27. Mm. And then my margin is 2, 3. And that's the margin is what is my profit to pay, gross profit to pay for all my costs as well, my staff, my... So, so before I go to 32, so when people are complaining at 32, what really, 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 really banks are seeing at 3 or 4 or 5, that is where they play for. Mm. 20, 25 is already uh, being paid for clients because you are competing with government. Government uh, or central bank is paying uh, T-bills at 25, they say 20 to 25. So the customer has a choice to go and pay 20, 25 with government mm. or bring it to you. So mm. that's where we start from. That's where before we build our cost onto it mm. before we arrive mm. at the end interest margin. Mm. So please, it may be 33, but just under five is coming to bank. And in the markets down the, in the regions that we operate as well, some are saying that interest rates is very high in this country. It is how very we, high. How do we get around it? I mean, some will say the macro situation improving. Even instances where inflation has gone down, down, down. The rates Inflation were so. I'm just saying, not now, but we've had in the past where we've had a single digit before that didn't reflect that much no, in the it interest rates. We, we have we have had, we have come close to single digits in uh, interest, interest rates. Yeah. So so what people see are the headline numbers. So for example, I have a lot of customers who are nowhere near the thirty. Mm. Those are the customers who have demonstrated that uh, they they can they can operate in a certain uh, you know margin. Their risk return. It, it's, it's, it's a measure and mm. we give them reward that we reward them for for that particular behavior so mm. not everybody gets the high end of it but yes uh, we we drop and i know we've come to as low as 12 13 14 50 percent mm. interest rate when it came down mm. so when we stop borrowing um, the government starts borrowing at, at the rates they are at the moment uh, people will now come to the banks with lower rates and therefore, the banks will be able to lend at much lower rates as well. There are some people who think that even 23 commercial banks for this economy is too high. And going forward, maybe consolidation need to happen. There are even some who are pushing that. Let's, let's first start with the bit about the, the recapitalization and the proposals. I mean, there are some who are pushing for risk base. There are some who are pushing for the one size fits all. There are some also pushing that, listen, Let's look at the market in which these individual banks play and let be the corresponding capital or minimum capital. That is a risk-based approach. What are, what are your thoughts on this whole argument about uh, raising the capital as a tool to force consolidation? Um, I, I don't think it is really an issue of capital alone. Yes, capital matters because capital is where it starts from, as in your strength to be able to lend your strength to be able to give back um, your customers their deposits when they want it and all of that. So capital matters. Uh, but it's also a bit more around the risk regime in terms of how we manage risk and how we operationalize all these um, um, issues around when people uh, lend, you lend money to people, you can get it back. And that's why all these primary issues around um, even things like KYC and all that that we've done to make sure we can go after our money once we give it out is important. The most important thing for a bank is for them to be able to take the money back when they give it out. Because it is somebody's money you are giving out. Mm. Once you can't take the money back, you are in trouble. So capital is just there as a buffer. But primarily, when you take um, depositors' funds and you lend, you should be able to bring it back mm. to the depositors when they need it. Mm. Uh, consolidation, maybe. I think 2025 is actually a fairly good number. Um, and not all banks should be everything. Banks must focus on where their strengths are. We have agri banks, we have development banks, we have trade banks, we have pure commercial banks, we have um, 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 let's say, uh, mortgage banks, and so on. So there are different nuances, <coughs> and if you look through carefully, that's what we have. Mm. Um, the issue is banks should be incentivized to make sure they focus on specific... I don't want... Uh, agriculture banks are now all living to become just pure commercial mm -hmm. banks because the risk there is slightly much higher. You don't buy the universal banking approach where it's given to you. There should be universal banks. 
one the, bank can do virtually most banks everything. Most banks are investor banks. Just by not creating there a human be, being. There must be, be the station factor. There must be specialization. Mm. You must have a universal bank as, as, as part of your strategy. But your core strategy may be universal. But everybody must have a specialized area where, because you must, remember, you must, you must train, you must have the resources. You can't, not every bank can have the, have the uh, if you like, the resources mm. or the skill set to be able to go and start doing, uh, say you are doing oil and gas and you go upstream. Mm. You go upstream, you must understand what is going on there. You can't start buying rigs. Uh, it's, not, it's not an industry you just mm. start playing because it's where a bank. But you can say, yes, I can do something with the traders. I can understand their working capital life cycle and stay with them and go through the process with them. That you can do. You can say, I'm an agricultural bank that is supporting agriculture-based uh, 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 value add so that um, as, uh, even if you are not going to do to primary production, you can go to value add where you are mm. helping them to convert their primary produce into produce that can be stored and mm. all of that. So there are those niches that are available. Mm. So even if you are 2025, 20, banks must have niches where mm. they play very strongly. Mm. So they build a skill set. And therefore, once they build a skill set, they become even more, more, more useful to their clients. Because clients come to us for corporate advisory. They don't just come for, to us for money. Mm -hmm. So when you come to me, I must be able to speak to you mm -hmm. around the pitfalls based on a long period of, of, of engagement in that area. Mm -hmm. Things look very simple. Everybody mm -hmm. thinks everything is simple. Mm -hmm. They just get up and so I heard my friend is, is, is cultivating tomatoes and they make 30% uh, on it. I'm going to go into it without understanding the mm -hmm. nuances where the risks lie. So and you buy more, the, the, do you buy the, the risk approach in recapitalization? Absolutely, every bank so must be risk-based. Mm. Absolutely. So, I mean, some are saying that, listen, let it go up, so it should go up. No, no, no. I think um, it should it not necessarily go up, but it should be people playing where they know. Mm. You talked about the, the, your, your, your growing your branches and looking at your parent bank, very strong. As... An acquisition on the table, and I know you, I don't expect a yes or no from you. What's but that's, that's a growth strategy. It is always, it is you always look at consolidating. Look, look, uh, organic growth is very difficult. I have to say, organic mm. growth is very difficult. Just to build one branch, you must go through a whole lot of things. So it's very difficult. And I told you, I've, I've, I've done about 10 branches in the last few years, not because I didn't want to do more, but you can there's only a pace at mm. which you can go because. You are building everything from the scratch. Mm. But um, so inorganic growth is also always attractive. Mm. We have to be very careful mm. to make sure synergies. The, the, the synergies are mm. there, else you are going to even buy yourself some more problems. So let's just say we are looking at both. Mm. So it's on the table. And we sh we it, it's be. not off the table. Mm. I would say it's not off the table than to say it's on the table. And that should happen right very now. Soon. It's just me for that, on my that could happen very Organic soon. growth and, and making sure I, I do my brick and mortars and convert them to brick and clicks. What should you expect from the bank going forward? Oh, to be like, um, to be, we say, a, first bank, uh, a bank of first choice, mm. to be in the top 10, to be a bank of relevance, to be a systemic bank. Like you said, my parents is, is the, one of the biggest banks in Africa. Almost 700 branches in Nigeria. It's a huge, massive bank. Mm. Uh, 130 years of, of, of banking. We have a lot of experience. We expect to continue to do that. And um, this is exactly, we say we want to be the bank of first choice. Mm -hmm. Customer centric, entrepreneurial, very professional, making sure we use all these factors um, to ensure that we are a bank of relevance in mm -hmm. Ghana mm -hmm. and move from a tier four, tier three into a tier two and hopefully into tier one. What is the lending situation now, one would ask? I mean, some have said that the environment has made every bank so, so cautious. Yeah. What is the lending situation? I mean, banks are being now more, more cautious because it's they moderate. don't want their fingers to be bent. It's moderate. It's, it's still there. It's moderate. Um, and also, when things happen like that, people are more short-term than long-term, short to medium-term takeover. Um, it, it's always a reflective because you can't predict too much into the future. That's the mm. problem with, with these things. But once mm. the macro stabilize, I think too many. But it, it's not aggressive. Lending is not aggressive now in banking. And... Um, some measures have been taken even by central bank, even though they say it's not the intention. For example, it's become penal not to lend. Mm. So it's it's not it's moderate. Do as the situation improves, obviously, the loan we, book we is going to, to lend grow. To, we need to lend to make a good return. Mm. Banks want to lend. It is it is the is that the reality? Because of banks. it appears that when you look at the loan book across the industry, it is not growing. Banks yeah. are not lending. You spoke about NPL. 
Yeah. We want to learn, but we want the money to come back when we learn. So we must ensure that the money is coming back before we learn. But banks want to learn. Indeed, banks want to learn. Mr. Victor Santi is MD and Chief Executive of the First Bank. I know the debate will still be going on in your homes as to whether all the banks in the country are quite strong and resilient or still the challenges are there. This has been PM Express Business Engaging, engaging the Managing Director and Chief Executive of First Bank. And I'm, I'm saying I appreciate your time so much. And I know Thank we'll be talking much. again to see after the, the acquisition happens, maybe <laughs> we'll come back to you and, and find out what were the rationale behind. This has been PM Express Business Edition. Have a great day.